Sakuna of Rice and Ruin is a game that combines two genres. Side-scrolling action platforming, and... Oh boy. Farming simulation. Now, I bought this game hoping to God that the action platforming can carry the farming, because I don't think I've ever played a farming game that was fun for me. Ever. So if this game sucks, this is it for me in farming games. It's just over. So we gotta find out. Is Sakuna of Rice and Ruin the only fun farming game ever made? Now a basic premise of the game's plot goes like this. The player character Sakuna, who's not only just a goddess, mind you, but a princess goddess, and a group of lowly, troublesome humans get banished from the deified lofty realm to the Isle of Demons for messing up this big rice. At the Isle, Sakuna and the others need to survive from scratch by, what do you know, farming rice and cooking dead demon meat. What's surprising though is that the main characters in this game are all very well done. And I'm talking specifically about Sakuna and the others at the farm. The game takes its time developing these guys, you learn about the little nuances of each, and each member of the farm all go through their own character arcs and change over the course of the story. Sakuna herself goes through the most change of all. When we first meet her, she's drunk, lazy, looks down on everyone else because of her birth, but as the story progresses and she struggles with the others to survive, she grows more responsible and learns the value of hard work. Eventually, when the stakes are raised and things get truly, truly dangerous for everybody at the farm, Sakuna steps up to the plate as the hero she was always meant to be and protector of the people she's grown to love. And since I'm going through this whole journey with her, I couldn't help but feel the same way. I grew to care about these people just as Sakuna did. There's a lot of genuine, honest-to-God, heartfelt moments in this game. A lot of aww moments from me. And I wasn't expecting this kind of charming tale from this game at all. I came in just wanting a farming focused game that's actually fun to play, but this game went the extra mile in having a story that made me give a damn about the central characters. And that was a very pleasant, pleasant surprise for me. Quick side note though, the main villains of this game are a big letdown. They're just complete one-dimensional trash. They're evil for evil's sake. Bad cause bad, that's pretty much all there is to them. They're very weak in their character development and if you compare them to the depth of the main characters at the farm, it's not even close. It's like night and day. Let's finally get into the gameplay now. A basic rundown of the gameplay loop goes like this. There's a day and night cycle to this game, right? So you start each day bright and early on your farm, you manage your rice fields, then you go out into the world to clear levels and fight demons, usually until it gets dark because demons become much more dangerous at night. All of their stats get buffed. During the early game especially, you do not want to get caught out after dark. It will do almost no damage to these guys and get killed in like one or two hits. You want to push on as far as you can with fighting and exploring during the day while the sun is up. Then at dusk you return to the farm and you finish up whatever you were working on in the fields during the morning or tidy things up like pulling out weeds that grew while you were away. Then at the end of the day you have a nice cozy meal with the main cast of the farm using the supplies you've collected from the levels to cook into dishes that buff your combat stats for a limited amount of time for the next day's cycle. Then we rinse and repeat. But now the big question. Is farming in this game actually fun? Did they do the impossible? Is this the first game in the history of the world to make farming in a video game not boring? At the end of the day, no. But farming was actually enjoyable at the beginning. And I think that was because there's a lot of steps involved in farming rice, and that variety kept things fresh at first. First, we need to sort out our weak rice seeds 
from our strong ones by stirring them in a pot full of mud or salt. The weak seeds will float to the top, while our strong seeds will stay at the bottom. The more you stir though, the less seeds overall you'll get to plant, but they'll be of higher quality. So you need to pick, quantity or quality. Then you gotta clear rocks out of the field that come back every season too for some reason, so your plants have more room to grow. Next we have to till the soil so we can actually get on to putting our rice seedlings into the ground. Once they're planted we need to wait for our rice to grow, but now we have to manage our water levels, get rid of pests and weeds affecting our farm, and apply fertilizer until the rice is ready to be harvested. Once we harvest our rice, we hang out our rice to dry for a day or two, where we then thresh the rice to separate the edible pieces from the stalk. Lastly, we then haul the rice until it's either brown or white. After that, it's finally ready to eat. It's actually all pretty educational, you know? I bet a lot of people will feel like they can start their own rice farm after playing this. I know I did, but my backyard is too small, and I don't think my dog's diet of bacon treats will act as good enough manure to get my rice really going. Sakuna gains new skills the more you do these farming tasks, making things easier and allowing you to complete each task just a little quicker. For example, the first couple times you plant your rice, you'll just have to plant them and space them out by eyeballing it. Eventually, you'll be able to plant multiple seeds at once, and you unlock a skill that allows you to see a grid for proper spacing, but even then it can still be a bit difficult to place them exactly where you want them. When you first start harvesting, Sakuna only cuts down one stalk at a time, but eventually you're cutting through them so fast, Dynasty Warriors characters would blush. Your farming tools themselves get better over time as well, courtesy of the peasant boy Kinta making new ones for you. And let me tell you man, if you got a bad heart, you need those upgraded farming tools. My thumb got so tired hauling rice at first, I almost passed out. Same thing with the threshing. Working on every single individual stalk by hand, the exertion needed could kill a man if he's not careful. But when you give Kenta supplies to make new farming tools, along with Sakuna gaining more skills to speed things up, you fly through all that crap in no time. Thank you, technology, for sparing our thumbs and our hearts. All these farming steps, by the way, take up most of the daytime hours. So a little gameplay tip is to not waste good food that will give you strong buffs the night before if you know you're going to be spending the next day mostly farming. The best time to go out and fight is when you're just waiting for your rice to grow and you just need to clear out weeds and pests and manage the water. Each time you complete a full farming cycle, all of Sakuna's combat stats go up and how far they go up depends on the quality of your rice and how you manage your fertilizer. This is how you level up, basically. Enemies in this game have set levels to them, like most JRPGs. If you go into an early game area with level 1 mobs, and you're multiple levels above them, they're gonna do only one damage to you, even the bosses, while you kill them all in one or two hits. Conversely, if you go to an area under leveled, you'll probably end up getting two or three shotted. Now, if a player is just getting their but handed to them in the wild. Let's say it's your average modern day video game journalist. They could, if they wanted, just stay at the farm season after season and just grind through farming cycle after farming cycle, raising up their stats and their level until they can just brute force everything. But at the end of the day, it sucks that this game did not succeed and making farming fun in video games for me. Learning the steps involved for a successful harvest each cycle was kind of fun at first, I will admit, but the longer you play and the more you farm, it all just starts to feel very... like flowcharty. Rice is the only thing you can plant and grow in this game, and the steps to grow it never changes. You'll essentially be doing the same farming activities in the same order throughout the entire game. 
Most of the time, you're just going to be following the same repetitive button prompts over and over and over again. Press X to plant the seeds. Press X to pull the weeds out. Press X to clear the pest before you head off to hunt. When you come back home, you better get that X button ready to pull out more weeds. Yada, yada, yada. When you're hauling or threshing rice, it's the same crap too over and over again throughout the entire game. Left, right, left, right, up, down, up, down, up. You can just turn your brain off and go through the motions. The only real thinking you'll have to do after you're used to the farming is just managing your fertilizer. Whatever you put in there will contribute to the stats that go up when Sakuna levels up at the end of each farming cycle, so if you feel like you need more health, when you make your fertilizer, throw in some acorns to get your vitality up. You need to do more damage, well, throw in some strength powder to increase your attack, etc. Now there are a bunch of scrolls that give you more detail on how to max out your rice quality and fertilizer use. They have steps telling you things like, for a good summer hardiness, apply kernel fertilizer until the ears sprout. Then once they're sprouted, apply leaf fertilizer sparingly. Afterwards, leave the plants in shallow water while they ripen. But for a good summer yield, don't forget to dehydrate the plants midsummer. And I'm just like, screw that. I think I'll just have maxed out fertilizer of every kind all the time. Water levels, eh, I'll just leave that at like 30 to 40%. That seems good enough for me. Oh, it's raining outside? Good. I'm not going to even bother watering then. Now, according to the game, the larger your rice plants grow, and the closer they get to finally being harvested, they need to be in deeper and deeper water if you want to max out the quality of your rice. But I am not going to waste the precious daytime hours sitting there at the water gates, waiting for my rice field to turn into a pool when I felt like I needed every second of the daytime I could get when I went out to fight. Let's step off the farm now and talk about the zones you'll be exploring and fighting in. You select a zone from the world map, and each zone has a number of levels in it. Early on in the game, level layouts are simple. You're just going to be going from left to right in a straightforward path for the most part. But as the game goes on, levels get more complex, with more branching paths to take, more environmental hazards like falling rocks, lava, even bubbles to screw with you, and of course, more swarms of enemies to contend with. You have to reach the end of a level to be able to select the next, obviously, but sometimes you'll have to go through multiple quote-unquote floors of levels until you reach a gate that functions as a mid-zone checkpoint. And remember, that clock is always ticking closer and closer to nightfall, so you'll have to be going through these areas at a good pace if you want to reach the next checkpoint before dark. During the mid-game onwards, you'll definitely want strong food buffs from supper the night before to make it through these areas quicker and easier. I would recommend always getting the natural healing attribute, which regens your health when out of combat so you can stay at full health as often as possible. When you do die though, and you will die a lot, trust me, you're sent back to the beginning of the level you're in and you lose all the items you found in that level, but your health is reset to full and the time and hunger levels are reset to whatever they were when you first entered. Thankfully, loading times between deaths are instant as well, so you can jump immediately back into the action to try again. Every area changes visually depending on the season. Lots of rain in the spring, healthy greens in the summer, leaves changing color in the autumn, you get it. It's nice to look at, you know, especially at your farm. I gotta give the developers credit for going through each area of the game four times and making sure there are enough visual differences for each season to make it look natural. Environmental diversity is pretty decent too. You'll be traveling to waterfalls, deep forests, caverns with lava, ruined battlements, all with their individual hazards to deal with. Platforming in the game is pretty basic and straightforward. You'll mostly be using basic jumps and Sakuna's Divine Raiment, a magic cloth, to attach to different platforms to navigate through the level. You'll have to avoid a few obstacles here and there, like falling rocks and lava, 
but you won't have to worry about having pixel perfect accuracy to make jumps and landings. Everything is generally pretty wide enough to land on without too much fuss, and Sakuna is very responsive while she's in the air, so it's easy to land exactly where you want to land. You won't have to worry about instant deaths and platforming, you know, like you miss a jump and you fall into a bottomless pit and die instantly. There's none of that in this game. You'll just take damage from a spike or something and hopefully you have enough health left over to try again. The vast, vast majority of your deaths will come just from fighting enemies in the stage. If you die to an environmental hazard most of the time it's because you got knocked into it by an enemy, not because they're hard to avoid when you're platforming. In fact, after 40 hours of playtime, I don't think I've ever died once solely due to difficulties platforming. Now combat. Combat is where the real gameplay depth comes from. Now, my first impressions of the combat in this game, and this is talking about only an hour in at this point, was that it did feel smooth and responsive enough. It starts out very basic, you have your light, heavy, and special attacks, each of which change depending on the direction you're holding your analog stick. Your animations on your basic attacks are clean and fluid, everything flows together well enough. What makes Sakuna unique, though, as a combatant, is her use of the previously mentioned Divine Raiment, which not only allows you to attach and swing around the environment, but to enemies as well. I thought, okay, this is simple and easy enough. At first, I thought I don't even need to worry about getting those food buffs at night, I just won't get hit. These starting enemies are nothing to me. That first boss? Beat him on the first try, no sweat! So far, the hardest thing about this combat system is listening to Sakuna's combat yells in the English dub. I mean, just listen to how annoying this sounds. Can you imagine being stuck listening to that for 40 plus hours? I have to admit that after 12 hours of listening to these banshee yells, I couldn't take it anymore. I had to change the English voices to Japanese to save my eardrums, which was a real shame because the English acting was good. But besides that annoying screaming, my initial thought of the combat in these first few hours or so was that it was functional, yeah, but kinda basic and rather shallow. Get in an enemy's face, spam basic attacks, and swing around them with your raiment if you get in trouble. If this is all there is to combat, this will probably get boring quicker than the farming does. But then you fight the second boss of the game, Red Belly. At first, I was just gonna try to fight him normally, like I've been doing with every other enemy in the game so far. I'll just get in his face and smack him till he drops. But then I notice I'm like doing no damage to this guy. I mean, what the hell is going on here? Why is he so tanky? I started to feel like I was fighting a Sekiro boss here with how little damage I'm doing to this guy. Can I get like a like a posture bar to break or something here? At one point I was fighting this guy for so long, it actually turned from dawn to dusk. I fought him as early in the morning as I could, but still couldn't bring his health down enough to kill him before nightfall. When night comes, I'm screwed for sure, I might as well just bend over now, I'm just gonna get two-shotted. So I was like, okay, this is what you need those food buffs for. So I waited an extra day to buff myself up on food as much as I could, but while I was doing more damage with each attack now, it still wasn't enough. But then something finally clicked, 
and an entire new aspect of combat revealed itself to me. If you crash an enemy into another enemy, they do collision damage to each other. If you crash multiple enemies into each other, all of that collision damage stacks upon itself, doing huge chunks of damage at a time. And crashing those small mobs into Red Belly is the only real way to hurt him. This was a complete game changer to me. It turned what I thought was a shallow combat puddle to a giant ocean full of possibilities. Now I'm juggling enemies in the air to get them in the perfect place to launch them like a comet to hit Red Belly. And after dying to him a bunch of times, I finally got used to crashing enemies and just look at it. Here we go. Boom! One more time. Boom! One more time. Boom! Here we go, baby! Woo! Oh. Okay, okay. One more time, one more time. Come on, baby. There's one. Come on, baby. There's two. Here we go. Come on. Shit. Wrong way, wrong way. Shit. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, here we go. Here we go. Come on, come on. Come on, one more. One more. Ah, oh, shit. One more. Woo! Yes! I have to really give credit to the devs and how they designed the first few bosses of the game. Red Belly, Black Shadow, and White Gale, which are the second, third, and fourth bosses of the game you'll fight respectively. Now, they only have about three attacks each. That's it. But despite that, I died to each of them about 30 to 50 times. White Gale, the fourth boss of the game, took me an hour and 15 minutes of bashing my head over and over and over again against the wall till I finally took him down. That damn bird is on the same level as Ishin freaking Ishina, the final boss from Sekiro in terms of time taken to beat. Not as hard as Owl Father though. After about two hours of fighting that bastard, I had to go to sleep to beat him the next day. But the reason I died to this set of bosses more than any other by a long shot is because they were designed to teach you how to properly get a handle on the fundamentals of combat. Red Belly taught me about crashing enemies into each other. Black Shadow showed me how to parry. White Gale improved my raiment usage and showed me that your raiment actually gives you iframes and how to better angle my enemies in the air to spike them accurately on the ground. These three bosses are like the make or break point of the game for the player. Kind of like how Genichiro and Sekiro was. And what I mean by this is if you can get past these three specific bosses, you'll have the basic fundamentals down to succeed in the rest of the game. Everything becomes easier after you get past these guys, so much so that every boss after this, including the final boss, I beat either on the first try or after about five deaths max. One negative point I need to bring up quickly though about bosses is that with the exception of eight unique bosses, which is an alright number, don't get me wrong, every other boss in the game is just a giant version of a normal enemy. They even share the same attacks. Kind of a bummer. But as you play more, you'll be pleasantly surprised just how deep the combat can get. While your basic light and heavy attacks never change, you do unlock quite a few different skills for your raiment and special moves. You can equip up to four of each, one for each direction of your analog. As I said earlier, your raiment can only swing you around enemies in the environment at first, but eventually you'll unlock abilities to toss enemies around you like your Spider-Man. And when you're really good at it, it becomes like an extension of your arm. You'll be able to use your raiment to apply debuffs too to the enemy if you so choose. Same goes for your special moves. At first, you only have your basic launch attack, but eventually you get more advanced moves like Tidal Wave and Whirlwind. And what I really like about your specials is, for the most part, you'll never completely stop using a certain attack because you unlock one that does the same exact thing but with more damage. Each special attack has different functions. Let's look at Tidal Wave and Boiling Rage, for example. Both can launch enemies up in the air to further combo, 
but Tidal Wave also creates a shield in front of you to block projectiles. Boiling Rage, on the other hand, you can charge up for more burst damage, but if you're hit while charging, it goes up to full power instantly. So yes, both attacks are launching enemies up in the air at the end of the day, but they have very different ways of going about it. Another quick example, one of the best special moves in the game is your starting launch attack, Frontal Smash. It will launch 90% of all non-boss enemies, no matter the size instantly on the first hit, allowing for some easy crash damage. But there is another move, Lido, that will do the same thing, it's going to launch enemies horizontally at each other, but it will not launch the larger enemies instantly like Frontal Smash does. You have to break down their poise first with some basic attacks before you can send them flying, but the trade-off is that Lido does more damage. So you have to choose, do you want the safer, instant launches that Frontal Smash does, or do you want to risk getting close and breaking down enemy poise first to get the extra damage that Lido does. There's a bunch of nuance to the choices a player can make when deciding how they want to fight in skill selection alone, and that's not even counting your gear options or the different power-ups that you can equip. Do you want to make a lifesteal build? Or a crit build? Tank build? Glass cannon? There's so much room for personalization in how you build your Sakuna, I don't think any two players will fight the same. Late game, they're going to be throwing swarms and swarms of enemies at you. But at this point, if you made it that far, you'll be a combat demon. When late game comes, and your build is all set and ready to go, you've experimented the whole game to find your favorite moves, your raiment usage is on point, you'll actually appreciate these swarms because you can finally let loose and put everything you've learned throughout the course of the game to use at your full potential. You can just flow to create a beautiful painting of your own violent expression. Combat is, without a doubt, the strongest and best part of this game, and I can recommend this game to action fans without question. Now all the big positives are out of the way, I need to talk about the two biggest factors in this game that hold it back the most. And to my surprise, farming was not one of them. They are the needless padding of the game and the bugs. In the game, there is something called an exploration level. Your exploration level goes up when you complete certain objectives in each zone. Some of them are simple, like reach the end of a level defeat enemies in the innermost area of a level, defeat 50 enemies, to more advanced ones like crash 30 enemies, return a clam's projectile attack, reach the end of a level in 2 minutes. Now it is very important to understand this. As you play the game, you'll find out you cannot unlock new areas to explore and continue the game unless your exploration level was high enough. So many times I'd be stuck. I'd beat in all the available levels, beat all the bosses, but my exploration level wasn't high enough to continue because I didn't do enough of these arbitrary side activities. Most of the activities I did complete were the ones you just get by going through the level normally. Objectives like reach the ending or defeat enemies in the innermost area. Now I know this depends on the player, but for me personally, I usually don't care about completing challenges like this because I just want to fight how I want to fight and I want to go through the level how I want to go through the level. I'm not going to go out of my way to deflect 10 clan projectiles if I can just dodge them instead. I'm not going to defeat 30 enemies by using a blunt weapon if my best weapon I have on me is a piercing weapon. Nah, I think I'm going to pass on equipping the fire resistance power up for this level. I prefer the power up that gives me a portion of my health back after clearing a group of enemies much more. Like I said, I like to fight how I like to fight. I could care less about changing how I fight to complete challenges like this, but the game forces you to complete these challenges to get your exploration level up so you can continue progressing through the game. 
and a lot of these tasks are just boring busy work. Bounce 20 things off of mushrooms. Ah, <sighs> alright. Break three barrier stones. Okay. Collect three iron pieces. If I have to. Some are complete RNG, like collect salt in this area. But the only way to do it is to hope it comes up when you gather there. So I would sit there and reload the same section over and over again and gather and gather and gather, wasting my time until the RNG gods were finally kind enough to give me the damn salt. Being forced to do these exploration tasks were the most unfun times I had with this game. At one point I had 20 total areas available to me, and again I was locked off from progressing until I got my exploration level up. Of these 20 areas I had available, right, there were 56 total exploration tasks I could do. I had to grind through maybe 2 to 3 hours of doing these tasks until eventually I got 39 of them completed which was 69% of all total exploration tasks available at the time, and I still had to do more. Like I said earlier, I wouldn't even bother with these normally, but here I was, forced to do 69% of them, and still I couldn't continue. It was at this point of the game where I came closest to just dropping it for good. I'm stuck in the game, not because of a lack of skill in beating the levels and enemies, or having a weak, weed-infested farm. I'm stuck here because of this damn exploration level. Thankfully, thankfully, after completing one more task, getting 40 out of the 56 done, I finally got my exploration level high enough to continue. Thank God. But having to complete 40 out of the 56 of them to continue is having to complete 71% of all available exploration quests at the time. Now doesn't that seem just a tad too high to be able to keep on going through the game? It does for me! The extra padding of the game doesn't stop there though. At one point, midway through the game, something happens in the story that causes Sakuna to lose all of her powers. And what this means for the player is that all of your overall stats like your health, defenses, and attack damage go down. You're pretty much back at level 1 stats wise until you regain these powers. And guess what? You can't progress through the game until you get these powers back. And guess what else? The only way to get them back is to go through levels you've already beaten multiple times now to raise those exploration levels. Go back through those levels again to get your powers back. Some of them are hidden in chests throughout the level, so have fun wasting time playing hide and seek with that. Make sure you have the treasure finding mask on or you'll be wasting even more time searching high and low for those things. Other lost powers you get back by refighting bosses you've already beaten, but they have no cool things like new patterns or moves, just buffed up stats. So again, more repetition, more busy work, more padding of stuff you've already conquered and had your fill with long ago. The game is also buggy. Buggy enough where it affected my overall enjoyment of the game. First off, I hope you're ready for a lot of this. You'll be getting stuck like that on slopes a lot. Enemies will also get stuck on slopes and that makes them a little harder to hit, and sometimes they'll even get stuck inside a wall. A lot of levels have sections that don't let you continue forward until you've cleared all enemies in the surrounding area, and if they get stuck in a wall, tough luck buddy, you're gonna have to restart the level and do it all over again. Even bosses can get stuck inside the environment, and at one point I launched a boss so far, he got launched out of the fighting arena and couldn't get back. So he stuck his screen over, and me and the boss are just staring at each other through this hole, when one of us should have been dead by now. And lastly, I want to bring up that the game crashed about 8 times for me in a total play time of 40 hours. These crashes would usually come at the startup of the game when continuing a save from the main menu, 
So that wasn't terrible. But sometimes they would crash after losing to a boss. In fact, after I beat the final boss, I was completing the Amagashi Shrine, a 100 floor challenge area, just to see if I could. Every 5 floors, you fight a boss, and if you beat them, you get a checkpoint. And I was working on beating the 75th floor boss. But I died to him, and the game crashed. And now, while I only lost 5 floors of progress there, it was still frustrating to me enough where I decided, screw it, I'm done with the game. I've had my fill with it. I haven't touched it again since working on this review. Those final moments I had with the game, with that final crash, were a sour note to end my experience with the game on Yes. The over padding and the arbitrary roadblocks the game puts on you to slow down your progress, and the bugs definitely put a damper on my fun with this game, that's for sure. But overall, the good of Sakuna of Rice and Ruin outweighs the bad, and it is worth your time and money. The characters grow on you and get deeper over time just like the combat does. There's tons of wholesome moments in the story that made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside, and even though the farming still has the ancient gaming curse of being dull and repetitive after a while, the story and the combat did more than enough to carry it. The biggest sense of accomplishment I felt was just how much better at the combat I was at the end of the game compared to how I was at the beginning. It's like night and day, man. Novice to master. And that journey of mastering combat alone was enough to make it worth it, and the good story is just a really nice extra bit of frosting on the top.